Hello, everybody, and welcome back to my podcast, Christian in Progress. My name is Samuel Perez, and just a little bit about myself, I am a former gay stripper. Yes, that's right, you heard that correctly. I left behind the homosexual lifestyle to walk with Christ. And this podcast is all about how I do it, why I do it, and to help others like me and educate those that are not like me. Um, I want to talk, but I really want to talk about what a real life with Jesus looks like in 2023. Nothing is off limits, and I want to be as transparent and um, as vulnerable as I possibly can be. Before we get started, I want to let everybody know that this podcast is completely free to listen to, and we do accept donations, and we have some awesome rewards and gifts for those who want to become patrons of the podcast. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, Click on the description and you'll find the link to becoming a patron of the podcast, which means you'll be making a regular monthly commitment. And we also have my website, SamuelAbrahamPerez.com, where you can find resources to give through PayPal, Venmo, or Cash App. On today's episode, we have the incredible Joshua Zatkoff. He is an evangelist, a peer recovery specialist, and he has been delivered from mental illness and addiction. So how are you, bro? I'm so excited to have you on. How you doing, man? I'm glad to be here. Dude, I'm, I'm so pumped. Like, okay, I have to tell you guys how I actually saw Joshua. So I was on social media and uh, his video came up. I believe it was the video that you did. I think it's, is it Deaf Testimonies or something like that? Uh, uh, De La Fe. De La Fe, yeah. <laughs> I, knew, I knew you had the word D in it. Um, and he had these awesome, uh, what do you call those, like cornrows. I had, your, I had dreads, actually. Dreads, dreads, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. I get this confused. And I was like, oh, dude, this, this guy, he looks so much like a friend that I have. And I was just like, like his, his hair just really got my attention. Obviously, I love hair. Uh, I wear wigs all the time. Or maybe it's my natural hair. Who knows? Uh, but it just caught my attention. And then I started listening to his testimony through that. And I was like, I got to like follow this dude. He seems like, I don't know, like we would be about it together. Like we're kind of on the same like uh, wavelength in terms of God and our appearance and different things. And so I was like, let me invite him to the podcast and here he is. And so he's going to be sharing his testimony with us. So tell me, uh, where did you grow up? Like, where are you from? Tell me a little bit about your beginnings. So my beginnings are, you know, I'm from Virginia, born and raised, lived here my whole life. Unfortunately, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a beautiful place. <laughs> Unfortunately. You know, it's, a, it's a, it's a, no, it's a great place. Virginia's sweet. We got all four seasons. There's a lot of good stuff to it, but I feel like, you know, the world's too big of a place to stay in one state for, you know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. so I'm 30. I've been here my whole life. Um, and so growing up, you know, I, I had a good family. Like I can't ever say like, uh, you know, we weren't rich, we weren't poor, but I have both my parents in the picture. I had, you know, had a sister, had a, you know, had a good family, uh, upbringing. Uh, I played a lot of sports growing up. That was like my main thing. That was all I did. I was always outside. I'm a '90s kid, you know what I mean. So we was always outside, and uh, and I played a lot of sports. And as far as like spiritually, I wasn't. I was uh, baptized Russian Orthodox, but uh, I wasn't indoctrinated. And I say that because we went to church, but that was it. You know what I mean? Like my parents weren't like strict Christian parents. We didn't talk about the God at home. We didn't read the Bible. Uh, I would say like the Lord's Prayer at night before bed, and then you know church. You just that's what we did Sundays, and then uh, once I was old enough to stay home alone, uh, that's what I did, and I stopped going to church at that point. I was probably you know ten or something like that. Um, and so growing up, you know, I had a good good upbringing. Uh, did a lot of sports, and and then I'd say probably around like twelve is when my life kind of you know started changing. Mm. What started like that change? So uh, I think everything was normal, and you know it's crazy because I didn't. I actually just came to this conclusion or realization, yeah. honestly, in the last year or two. I just kind of realized this, but when I was eight, I got molested by um, uh, my cousin who was a male in uh, in Puerto Rico, mm-hmm. and so I went and stayed with family. I have family in Puerto Rico, and uh, so I went and stayed there. And so when I was like, I think I was eight or nine, it's uh, one of those ages around there I went there and uh, basically I got molested by my my cousin and uh you know it was one of those things I knew it wasn't right like I remember being like this is isn't right um but I forgot about it and just pretended like nothing happened right wow and so if you would have asked me my whole life I would have said it didn't affect me because I really didn't think it did you know yeah um but now looking back I realized that it was very shortly after that 
that I started dealing with a lot of depression. I started dealing with a lot of, like, I was a little kid, 9, 10, 11. I started dealing with, like, self-hatred, getting extremely depressed. And, I, you know, I knew, I knew it was, like, something not right because I'd go around other kids and I'd be like, I don't feel like other kids are, like, thinking about themselves or life in this way you know what I mean like I I feel like I started getting very introspective and very um just in my head like very early on and and so anyway so I started getting like depressed and having severe anger issues even self-harm and stuff as a little kid you know and um and so I started dealing with that when I was like you know 10 11 and and around 12 is even when my parents say they saw the change and and so around 12 is when I started smoking weed and and you know that was wow yeah that's kind of crazy man like from the spiritual side now that that you've been kind of looking back on your life like do you think it was like demonic like this abuse um did it open up any doors or was it just like the psychological aspects of it like how do you feel about that that trauma oh yeah i definitely think there was spiritual roles to it or spiritual aspects to it and i definitely think it opened me up to something it opened me up to a lot of shame um And uh, like I said, I didn't see it until recently. But the other thing that I've noticed is that with stuff like that, it seems to run in the family, which Mm, in my case, it did. It's gone through through bloodlines, through different family members and, you know, other people in my family, my mom's side of the family have experienced it. And and so you can see, oh, wow, this thing travels down. And then I remember how it even affected me was, you know, as a kid, I started like but I knew it was wrong, so I would never act on stuff. But I would know, like start thinking about family, people sexually, or not sexually, even just like romantically almost. Like, oh, could I be with them? That kind of, you know what? So yeah. you see how it starts messing with you. Um, but then, yeah, ultimately it definitely had a very big spiritual effect on me that I didn't even realize, I don't think, until later, you know. So you started smoking weed, and was that like a... Like, a, first off, at a very young age, like 12 years old, man, that's like insane. Yeah, I would say, like, I probably, I can't, I never did any type of drugs, like, th- thankfully. <laughs> but I can relate to you on that because I did start, like, watching porn, I think, when I was in middle school. And I was, like, around, I think maybe 14, 15 years old. That's when I was, like, exposed to that. But did you feel like weed was, like, a, a gateway drug? Um, how did you get weed at 12 years old? Like, were you feeling guilty about it? I have a lot of questions about that. <laughs> no, it's crazy because when I look at kids that age now, having a daughter that's 11, when I look at kids now, they're 12, 13, I'm, I'm horrified by the stuff I was doing. Mm. I mean, I'm like, how in the world was I doing? Like, I mean, I was, I, I started everything very, very young. Like, and so it's very interesting because I think the same thing, I'm like, who the heck sells weed to a kid? My, you know, <laughs> like who does it? But. But no, I had, I mean, I had, I always had like some older friends and I had a friend who he had older cousins. So he kind of had connections to high school kids or whatever. And, um, and so, yeah, just, I, I started smoking ar- around like, it was like seventh grade summer, I think. And, um, and so anyways, yeah, I just started getting into it. And it, for me, it wasn't necessarily a gateway for a while. Um, it just, I remember it made me feel whole. Like I was like, oh, this is who I am. Uh, and I, I was convinced that I was the best me smoking. And so I didn't had no desire for anything else uh, uh, until I was probably, well, probably like a year later, like eighth grade summer was when I started drinking a more. I started um, trying like a cough syrup and cough medicine and mm. stuff like that. Um, they have the, uh, back in my day, it was like this, they called it the purple drink. Did they have yeah. that back then? <laughs> yeah, so it was the, the Robitussin, uh, triple C's. <laughs> I have no idea what it was. I just remember, like, I was in middle school, and I remember people being like, this purple drink is making people go crazy. And I was like, was <laughs> yeah, it was like, it really like, like, do crazy, crazy things. That's insane, man. So um, at that time, you weren't really going to church. But what was your knowledge and your understanding about God while you were doing those drugs? Like, were you like, oh, God sees me, or I have a fear of the Lord, or like, you know, guilty. How was your relationship to the Lord at no. that time? Well, it's it's funny because even though I grew up in church, it's like I had absolutely zero understanding or knowledge of anything. Because like, like I said, it wasn't put on me. And so when I was at church, I wasn't paying attention. I was a little kid, just whatever, you know, trying to sleep or something in the pews. Like, 
Um, so I had zero thought of God at that point, you know, like it wasn't even a thought in my mind at that age. Um, so yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't something that I thought about or was worried about or anything like that. It, it wasn't up until I was probably, um, it wasn't until I was like 15 that I started thinking about God in any capacity and those because I started doing mushrooms mm. and, um, that opened up a whole new door of, to me. And, um, I just remember I was 15. It was like, it was around winter time. And I remember just feeling like my whole life changed and being like, yo, there's like a spiritual world, I think. And you know what I mean? And being like, there's something more to this life. And that was kind of when I got introduced to just this feeling of us being connected and, oh, we're all one. And, you know, those kind of thoughts of, oh, it's about love. It's about this. And, you know, trying to navigate what the meaning of life is, I guess. And it opened me up to all that. And then uh, when I was 16, I was in a rehab. And in the rehab, I started reading um, Buddhist books. And so I started reading about Buddhism. And, I, you know, I got really into it, like really, really into it because it made so much sense to me. And basically everything that I was experiencing, all the thoughts I was having on the mushrooms were being backed up by the Buddhist, um, you know, ideology. So I'm reading about Buddhist beliefs and all that. And I'm like, oh, this is what I experienced on this. I was like, yeah, this is the meaning of life. So I'm like, this is it. And so I started following Buddhism. And that was like when I really started thinking about spirituality and God. And, but that was my understanding of it, you know? Yeah. So you, at that age, wanted to find like some sort of meaning. Uh, were you struggling with the drug use? Were you just like, no, I like the drug use? Or did you ever ask yourself the deeper questions like, oh, man, why am I using this? Or I'm unhappy or... Did you ever ask yourself those questions or it was just like, I don't care? Um, yeah, I think I did, but it wasn't like you're in so much denial and you're, you know it all when you're that age, right? So it's like, <laughs> yeah. for me, it was like the problem wasn't that at all. The problem was that like my parents kept getting in the way of me doing it. It's like, hey, everyone just, I'm, I, I'll never forget one time my mom, she asked me like, what do you, like, what do you want? What, like, what is it that you want? Why are you? And I said, literally, all I want is for someone to lock me in a room with endless weed and everyone just leave me alone. Like, that was, like, that's all I want. Just leave me alone mm -hmm. with weed and I'm good. Like, that's all I, you know? And so, um. What kind of feelings did that, like, elicit in you? Like, why was that so important for you? Well, it's just because I felt whole when I had it. So, you know, it was like when I didn't, when I wasn't smoking and stuff, I would just feel this dark depression. And, you know, this, like, deep, dark, like, emotionless life inside of me and so when I would smoke it I would have like emotions and and so like I said like I don't I didn't realize how like just I was in a very dark place very young for no really apparent reason you know it was just and that's why I know like stuff is spiritual because there was nothing really happening to trigger all that it was just on me you know for and it was just there and um so yeah okay so moving out of like childhood is when did you really start getting into like some bad drugs and, and bad life circumstances that kind of like led you into your experience with God? Um, so basically, uh, when I was, I was on probation, I got my first charge when I was 16. So when I was 16, I uh, was going through probation and I basically kept getting locked up because I was smoking weed. And so I would get out. They locked you up just for that? Yeah, they, I mean, especially back then, dude, like nowadays they don't really care about it on probation, but um, back then it's like they, they kind of had to, and I actually, I'm still in touch with my probation officer from this time. Like she's a really cool lady back then, even, um, she was, she was really cool. She was really nice. But the thing is, is like, so she'd let me fail a few. And then I think, honestly, I think her upper, like whoever was in charge of her was coming down on her. Like, Hey, you have to, you know what I mean? Cause she'd be like, look, you can't like, please pass the next one. Like, you know, and then. She locked me up for a month or two weeks or three weeks, and, and I'd get out. And I, I got tired of basically doing that. I was like, man, I need to find something else to do. And so I started doing, uh, there was, I had my friend, I was at his house one night, and he had a little blue pill, and it was uh, Roxy's. Well, this is when they weren't fetting all, like, the real real ones. And um, he said, bro, have you ever tried these before? Some friend gave it to me for weed, and to trade for weed or something. And so I said, no, nah, let's do it. So me and him did it, and I'll never forget, like, like me and him looked at each other at the exact same moment. We're like, bro, do you feel that? And it was like, it was, <laughs> I'm not trying to get graphic, but it was like, it was like my whole body having an ejaculation or something. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's what it felt like. Like it just felt like a giant orgasm through my whole body. And I remember just being like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing ever. 
And so at that point, it went downhill really fast. I mean, within mm -hmm. six months, I was shooting heroin. And so, you know, wow. before I'm 17, I'm shooting heroin. And uh, it was really innocent for a while because I had, I had a what do you, How does that work? Like heroin with, with the needle? Yeah, yeah. Dang, it's yeah, in the bloodstream. Yeah, yeah. Basically, I went to get them, get, go to the city one night to get the pills. We couldn't get them. And the guy that took us, he could only get heroin. So he said, uh, this is all I can get. And I was like, bro, I don't care. Just get whatever. That, that's that. You know, like, it's an opiate. And so I remember I was sniffing it, me and my friend. And then I look in the back seat, and the dude we're with, he's, like, got a needle, has his whole little kit, and has his, you know, spoon and all that. Mm -hmm. And I remember being, because I was just a, I always was like this as a kid, just, like, adventurous. So I remember looking at him and being like, he looks like he's having a lot more fun than me. You know what I mean? Like, he looks like he's, in, <laughs> like, he looks like he's enjoying this and not more than I am. So I said, hey, do you have another needle? I said, I need to do that. And, um... Uh, so he gave it to me, but I was honestly, I was already so high that I didn't, I didn't really notice it. Um, so it was like a few months later that I did it myself. Um, and so, yeah, that just takes on a whole new, it's just a whole new ball game. Um, because at that point you start getting dependent on it. You'll get physically sick if you don't have it. You start getting, you know, like you can't function. It's not like, oh, I just want to smoke a blunt, but I can't, you can still go to work. At that point, you are a slave. Like, you wow. have to have this thing or you're not doing life. And so it, it just takes you into a dark place pretty quick. It, and so, like, how did that lead you at all to your encounter with, with God? Yeah, so that was, um, well, that, so that was in 2009. Um, 2010 is when that all began. And so I had my encounter with God in 2017. So this is wow. a seven-year gap of going to jail, going to rehabs, going in and out of this stuff i had a suicide attempt in 2012 and in the suicide attempt um that was when i knew that there was a like a god like i always thought it was like this um just a universal something right yeah because you were studying buddhism <laughs> yeah and so so when i had my suicide attempt was when i basically uh i hung myself off a cliff the rope didn't come untied from the the, the fence or my neck and I was basically, I was, I was out, I was incapacitated and in a dreamlike state where I was uh, conscious, but I, I couldn't move and I couldn't breathe. And a light came towards me and I just and untied the rope. Basically, I didn't like the, the light got closer and then I just popped up right from the, I fell into a, a little Creek, like two, three feet of water. And, um, anyways, mm -hmm. the, uh, at that point I said, something cares about me. Like, I was like, yo, something like there's something out there that actually like cared about me at that moment. And freed me and so um is that like what triggered that suicide attempt um I, I at that point i was getting i was a heroin addict for a few years like three or four years um i had i was in a relationship with a girl that with my daughter's mom my oldest daughter's mom and she it was just a bunch of things it was just my life all these things piling up like i was always depressed i was always suicidal i wanted to kill myself all the time I was tired of being a heroin addict at this point. It wasn't fun anymore. It was just, it, it just sucked. Um, and then my best friend at the time had died, like my child, whole childhood best friend, he died that, the year before, about a year or so before. Uh, and so it was just this, this process of all these things happening over and over again and just feeling alone and just like, yo, I don't want to be here anymore. Like, what's the point of being here? You know, <laughs> like, like um, I feel you. I'm, I'm, and so I just didn't want to be here. And so uh, at that, that time, I was, you know, I was with this girl that was my daughter's mom. And she, she was, like, openly cheating on me. And I was, and like, that's how low my self-esteem was. Like, I was staying with her because I literally thought there was nothing else for me. So I might as well hold on to whatever would want me kind of thing. And um, she was supposed to, like, come hang out with me that night. She was on a date with some guy. And she was supposed to come hang out. And she faked. And I remember I just took that, and, and when I found out she wasn't coming, I was like, you know what? I was like, I think I'm just done with all this. Like, you know, I was like, yeah, I'm done. It wasn't even, like, emotional. I was just like, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm done. And I just, yeah. I just did it. I didn't even think about it. And, um, and so, yeah, that, after that, I knew that there was a meaning to life. And I wish I could say, like, oh, I got it together. I got clean. But I didn't. You know, it was like another, yeah. another long while, another six, seven years or whatever of, of being an addiction and so basically what led to the to all that is in 2015 i got locked up for a year and a half i got out in 2016 in june 
And basically, I was trying to rebuild my life because I was serious about trying to get clean. I was serious about changing my life. I had zero care about God or anything, but I was like, I need something. So I started going to church in 2016 just to like desperate, like something neat, like if there's something here, then maybe I'll find it. But nothing was happening. And so for a whole year, I'm like trying to rebuild my life. I'm calling out to God. He's not helping me. Nothing's happening. And so, were you calling out uh, to Jesus, or were you calling out to the Buddhist God? <laughs> no, I know I was calling out to Jesus. Like I was going to this Pentecostal church. There was this girl that was taking me there, and um, to be honest, half the reason I went is because I wanted her to like me, and I thought if I went to church, she would like me. And and uh, the <laughs> other half was because I I really wanted to change. And I remember that I went to a youth service one night, and the pastor called me up, and said, um. And she's like, so who wants to give their life to Jesus? I didn't raise my hand, but she pointed at me. I was like, come here. <laughs> and then, <laughs> That's not how that works, but okay. <laughs> yeah, she, yeah. But I did it, and I was like, all right, that was awkward. And I went back to my seat. And, uh, <laughs> and But nothing happened. It was like, you know, I would go to church, and I remember feeling like a little bit of peace, though. I will say, like, I remember feeling like sort of like a peace I didn't really experience before while I was there. But it was nothing like really like, oh, this is God. It was just kind of like, I do feel a little bit peaceful, but I thought it was just because I was doing something that was like not drugs. You know, I'm like, oh, this is something yeah. normal people do. It made me feel better about myself. And um, so anyways, it, it, it didn't do, it. nothing came from it. And I, it got to the point where I basically started getting my life together. I got my own place, got my license back, my restricted at least. And um, I started go, get like kind of getting, for, for me and for like an addict's point of view, I was in a very good place. I wasn't using heroin. I was only drinking and using Suboxone. I had a job. I had my own place. Like, to me, that was success. You know what I mean? At that point. Yeah. You can't, like, just function normally. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, I was holding it down for my life, I guess. And, you know, I thought. And um, and so, anyways, I, uh, in the ma- in the matter of two weeks, I, I wrecked and totaled two cars, caught two, two charges, was out on two bonds, ended up losing my job and ended up homeless all in two weeks. Mm. And it was like so ridiculous that it like, it was funny. Like I was like, what is going on? Like I'm out here trying my best. My life fell apart before my eyes. And so in that point I was homeless. So while I'm homeless, uh, all of a sudden started, stuff started getting very supernatural. I started having demonic encounters. I started, I was dating this girl whose mom would talk to me about God. Some lady at my work came up to me. She's like, God says you need to go see him. Um, and so I went to like uh, an AA meeting. And two weeks in a row, I end up going to the, the cathedral and being like, hey, God, I'm here. He said he needs to see me. What's up? And I ended up <laughs> opening to, <laughs> to Psalm 18 accidentally two times in a row. So just weird stuff started happening. I, I went to Pennsylvania. I, I got possessed one night. And my TV turned into demonic voices. And um, they started talking about, I mean, just all this weird, weird stuff started happening that I was like, what is going on? And so um, October 27th, 2017, I, I, I was going to go to a rehab the next day. So I, I was getting some heroin and I was like, you know, what? I'm going to get high one more time. I hadn't done it in a few months, um, specifically that. And I was crying out to God for like months, like, God, why aren't you helping me? And so I got so... I knew I was going to overdose. I wasn't doing it intentionally, but I knew I was going to. And so I, I said a, the Lord's Prayer, and I basically was like, Lord, I don't know what else you want from me. I said, I'm tired of this. Um, I said the Lord's Prayer while I was sticking a needle in my arm. And I said, this is all I know. Um, I said, forgive me. I'm like, I'm not, it was whatever. And, then, and, I, and I did the shot, and I, and I overdosed. I woke up in the ambulance. And so I, when I woke up in the ambulance, I went to jail. And... Uh, they had me on suicide watch. So for five days, I'm, I'm in this cell by myself going through withdrawals. It was, it was literally like hell on earth. It was the worst five days of my life. Um, just, I was coming face to face with my life choices in a first time that I actually was feeling them. And I, I realized I ruined my whole family. My family didn't want to undo them anymore. Every, like I just ruined my whole life and I, I knew it. Yeah. And so I started calling out to God. And I, I remember I told him, I said, God, I just want to be a good boy. I said, um, I don't even want girls anymore. I said, I don't care about the bar. Like I, like I always used to hold on to something, right? Like, like I would want to get rid of everything. And, but I, I wanted the women still, I would always hold on to everything, but the drinking, there was always something I had to hold on to. And this time was the first time I said, you know, I'm done with everything. Um, you know, and real fast, let me backtrack. It's, it's funny because I didn't know this at the time, but whenever that year I was calling out to God, 
I remember I started getting convicted about um, suboxone and, and having sex with the girl I was dating. And it was crazy because I did not know it was conviction. I just remember, like, I had no connection to God whatsoever. Never had an encounter, but I would start feeling guilty. Like, I would, like, do my suboxone and I would start feeling bad about it. I'd have sex with the girl I was dating and be like, and I remember I would say, like, hey, I don't think I want to have sex anymore until I'm married. And she would laugh and be like, shut up, you know, laugh. And then and I would, I would <laughs> kind of laugh with her and be like, yeah, I know. But then I would turn back over in bed and be like, her, like, no, I was serious. You know, like it's like yeah. movies when you see people like try to fit in, like, and I was like, no, like I, I really mean it, like, you know, yeah. but like, it sounded crazy for me to say. And um, so, anyways, in in jail, I basically started reading the Bible and I started praying. And uh, basically, over three weeks, it wasn't a moment I didn't have one of those encounters. Like, I, oh, I cried out to God, and this just happened. Um, basically, I just started reading the Bible and praying, and was sincere, and was like. All of a sudden, I started wanting to. I started getting hungry for the word. I started being obsessed with it. And then, basically, the next thing I knew, when I would pray in Jesus' name, like pray to Jesus, I would start being filled with joy. I'd start being filled with like all these feelings I never experienced. And the next thing I knew, I was a, I was just a different person. My heart changed. Like I, I think I honestly remember the night I was laying in bed and it felt like something was crushing my heart. Like it felt like some. I was. I thought I was about to have a heart attack. Like something just changed. I was a different person. I can't even explain it other than I got born again. That's, I mean, that's what happened. I got filled with joy and all this stuff started happening. So, Wow, that's incredible, man. Thank you for sharing. Um, how did that like transition over to like recovery then at that point? Like how'd you go from being in that jail cell to then like, you know, uh, hopefully getting out and, you know, <laughs> starting your new life in Christ what was that like did you start going to a church did you just start doing it on your own with the scripture um how'd you get your life kind of just like back on track well I think I, I'm grateful because I was in jail so I had two months of like this cocoon of protection mm -hmm. so like think like for two months all I did was pray and read the Bible like I was mm -hmm. just that was all I had to do that was all I wanted to do and that was all I was able to do and it was amazing so I remember this guy came in one day, he was a guest speaker, and he said, he was talking, and I said, look, like, I'm a drug addict. So I said, I sin across the board. I said, I hear you talking about sin, like, oh, I, you know, and you're picking out, like, one or two things. I said, look, I do everything. I'm all of them. I'm like, what? like, what am I supposed to do? Like, and he said, you're not a drug addict anymore. And he prayed for me. And he's like, tell me what happened next week. And I was sitting there like, this guy's nuts. I was like, I said, I'm in jail, bro. How I can't get high here what do you mean tell me what happened next week <laughs> and so what happened though was I noticed I, I was be I was like drinking 20 cups of coffee a day the next day I didn't have any coffee till like nine o'clock at night and then I just wrote it bro I literally I took that in faith I was like yo I'm delivered I'm not an addict anymore and I just stuck on that I stood on it and I was like nope and so that was it that, I mean I went to I, I bonded out two months later went to a halfway house and in the halfway house uh, I would go to a church it was a Christian based halfway house so I'd go to church Sundays and they made me go to meetings and stuff like that but that was it I didn't think about it ever again like I just I literally put on my new identity in Christ and and just I was delivered I didn't think about it ever again um really so that was kind of how I went about it um at that point yeah so where are you at like currently right now you said that you know you do peer recovery specialism and um where has the lord brought you since that time through a lot <laughs> um <laughs> it's, uh, it's been the hardest like five this is five years and count you know november was five years um this year so wow so we kind of got like saved around the same time yeah that is my lesson I got saved, like, uh, like really born again. Like, I knew about God, but it was, uh, I would say around February 2018. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, right at the same time. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, it was, it's been some of the hardest five years of my life. I mean, <laughs> honestly, like, God's brought me through a lot of stuff. It just, um, basically from there, it was just a process of building my life back. My life was in shambles. I mean, I had, I mean, I, I just got a bill in the mail for, like, $1,000 for, uh, court fines that I still owe you know what I mean like my life was in such a deep hole that there was just so I mean I didn't have a license I, and so it was a very slow process of just one thing at a time I guess and and um and so 
where I'm at now, though, is I just transitioned from I was doing labor job, uh, you know, um, now I'm doing peer, especially our uh, um, peer recovery specialist work in in clinics and and in the jail where I live. And so, you know, I'm just trying to. I got really into like ministry for a while, or not ministry, but I was I was I got very focused on Christian stuff for, at one point, right? Mm-hmm. And this last year, I said, you know what? I said, God the the recovery world really needs help I mean, yeah, yeah i felt like i had kind of neglected my people or something like maybe i <laughs> yeah. should put more focus on on where i came from and and some people yeah. say you know you're not always called to go back to where you got called from but one thing i know is that addiction's no joke and mm-hmm. we're not even seeing like 15 percent success rates in our our um recovery places you know what i mean it's like 90 percent failure rates i mean that's very bad <laughs> And so, you know what I mean? I was, and I was kind of like, you know what? Uh, the church has enough preachers and they have enough uh, teachers and enough prophetic conferences and this and that. Like, yeah. Or, um, the world needs like healing, you know? Yeah. And so I said, you know what? I'm done like trying to, I'm done trying to like be in this. Um, not that I'm apart from the church or something, but like I want to actually be out there helping yeah. people in a more official way because I was already doing that work. So I said, let me go figure out how to make a career out of it and get paid for it. And so. That's incredible, man. Just want to say, like, you have such a, a touching testimony. I've been through so much in your life, and uh, and I think the one thing I like the most is uh, when you called out to God and you just said, like, I just want to be a good boy. <laughs> yeah. And um, and I feel that, man. When when the Lord saved me, like, uh, I get I get emotional thinking about it. This is so good. Um, when He saved me back in 2018, like, it was kind of the same feeling. Like, I'm like, God, like, this this is all I got. Like. I got nothing else. Like how you, how you said, it was just like everything at that moment was like, I don't want this. I don't want that. Like I'm a total empty cup, like for your taking Lord, like do what you want with my life. Like, it's, it's like, it's such a rational decision too. You know, it's like, it's just like, I got nothing here, here. You can have it. And my, my life's a total mess. Um, and so I'm glad that the Lord has been able to uh, make something out of your life. And, and I talk about that all the time, especially being in ministry. Like people are always like complimenting me or, like, you know, saying good things about the ministry. And I'm like, glory to the Lord, because like, dude, I, have, I had nothing, you know, I was so weak and I'm still so weak. And the Lord is able to just like transcend that weakness, make it into strength. And so, uh, yeah, it's just so, and so incredibly beautiful. So, um, let's thank the Lord for your testimony and for your life. Amen. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, and I feel you on that as well. Like going back to the people that are, is originally, you know, you feel a calling towards, uh, same thing with me. Um, God knows, <laughs> I, I talk about this sometimes, God knows the last thing I would do is like, want to be around like gay people. <laughs> like when I got saved, I'll, all I wanted to do is just like be around other Jesus people and be in the church scene and be accepted by the church and, and do all that stuff. And, you know, I'm really glad that I went through the hardships that I went through. I actually was not accepted a ton by the church. Uh, still working on that. <laughs> but now, now I'm finally coming to a time where my ministry like has some sort of success or whatever. And now people are looking up to that more and more. But I wasn't, in the beginning, wasn't like that. And I never got the leaders, the pastors, the things that I wanted out of the religion. And, uh, and I'm glad that it worked out that way because the Lord was really calling me to a direct group of people that the church has completely ignored. And, and I didn't want to go to that, that group of people either. Like, I was like, I'm done with the gay guys. <laughs> I'm done with like, that scene. Um, and it's that, uh, I like to call it like the Harriet Tubman anointing. Where it's like you don't just free yourself, but it's like you go back to free the other people as well, and um and that's what he's. I feel like he's calling you. He's calling people like me. It's like we're not just done freeing ourselves, but we go back into the dark places to free those other people as well to come. And it, you're so right, dude. Like so many of us. Like there are there are the people that they get in that life of ministry, and that will become like their whole thing. They'll be in the church building forever. Um, and we need people like that to be able to intercede and, and do the prophetic and, you know, do all that stuff. Then we also need the people who are going to go outside the walls of, of the church ministry and reach those, those people that ultimately have not been loved on. Don't like, they'll never set foot in a church, you know? And even hearing your testimony, I'm like, man, like I, I would love nothing more than to like have encounters someone like you to, to be able to show them the love of Jesus. Um, and I get to do that now on the daily online, uh, hopefully trying to do it now in California as I go minister over there for a month. But I get to just see that, that so many broken people that, um, 
they don't want church. Like they don't, they, they're just looking for love. They're looking to be loved to like someone to tell them that they, that they matter, that their lives matter, that they're, that they're valued. And it's so hard to like, you know, minister to those types of people because they got so much rejection, so much brokenness that it's, it's not just like, oh, Jesus loves you. And then they're like, oh, I accept that. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, it's like, oh, I, I got that for like five minutes, but then I'm going to go use the drugs or I'm going to go have sex again, or I'm going to do this, and then now I'm broken again. And then they come back, and you got to, like, tell it to them one more time, like, restart the engine. Um, and so the Lord is definitely probably going to use you in that area. I, uh, how do you feel about going back there? Man, it's, I imagine that the LGBTQ community is very hard to reach. Um, I could see that being a hard community to reach, but I'm sure you coming from that is gives you a lot of, power in that um and people say like oh you have to come from it to talk about it and i realize that when you're in love it doesn't matter it does. I, I can i can reach the 80 year old lady just as much as i can reach a 20 year old kid because if i'm in love love is is um received by everyone because they're created to receive that um and so but i will say that going back to to try to help people out of addiction is very very hard it's it's just so hard because it's like it it's like nothing else but the power of God could help them. It's like there are the I mean that's what like literally we're saying ninety percent of people don't make it out of this dealing with like fentanyl opiates, um, specifically ninety percent of people aren't making out. So with that being said, it's like there are the people that make it out and find their little program. They don't find God. And I tell people all the time, hey, you want you just want to get clean. And you don't want God, that's fine. You could do that. I'll try to help you in that way and I'll tell you the tools and, and give you the help if you just want to do that. But um to get free from that is it's hard because there's so much going on. This isn't like, you know, someone just dealing with one issue. There are so many things intertwined and wrapped yeah. around it and there, it's so many different things feeding off each other to feed that and it's just it's just hard it's 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 exhausting it's it's easy to get discouraged and i have plenty of times and still do because it's just like you feel like you're not making a difference because you get people and they they come to jesus and then they're they're still getting high they you get people and you you know bring them through deliverance or something and then two weeks later they're going back getting high mm-hmm. it's not and people like and and i i've definitely dealt with church bitterness a lot with that because i've seen so many stories of people relapsing in the church acts like they're a piece of crap like they yeah. they don't treat it like it's some other sin like if if i go to church say, oh, guys i slipped up and watched porn people are supportive hey guys I, I slipped up and i i you know did this or that people are supportive of those sins but when and i, I know it's the same thing with with gay stuff as well it, it's like when you go into church i've seen it so many times People go to church, they're doing well, they relapse, the church starts treating them different, like they are less than. You doing that sin is way worse. You must not really love God. That's kind of the, that's kind of how addicts are treated. And I have a friend uh, who he's been in jail ministry for 20 years, and he told me that over 20 years he's asked addicts and people coming from jail life, how many times have you been invited over to dinner by anyone in your church? And, they, and he said no one ever has. In 20 years of jail ministry, you say, and so it's 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 hard because uh, these people, um, they're not finding that that love, and and it's like when when I talk about, and I, I see I'm, I need to probably chill right now because it, it my heart wants to talk about it, but <laughs> it's just it's just hard it's just hard for me to see because I've been through it, but I, I know that God has kept me through that. Like, but then when I see people that are they're just starting out. Yeah, and they're they're getting kind of pushed down, and and so anyways, that's it's just it's a it's a taxing uh, ministry for sure, and that's why a lot of people don't want to do it. A lot of people want to minister to people who already are built up, right? Like they want to minister to the people that are already established. Yeah, but it's one thing to minister and help build, and there's nothing against that because we need it all. Yeah, but if if I'm already coming to you like, hey, I already know how to pray, I already know, know God's voice for myself, uh, I already God delivered me from all this stuff. And you're just helping build my character and kind of shape me and be a leader and stuff versus someone like, hey, I have nothing. I don't even know um, anything. Yeah. Build someone from the ground up, right? So, so that's what it's, it, it, it's, a, it's just a taxing thing in that, that regard, I guess. So. Well, even in my ministry, you know, I talk about this all the time is like this restructuring that has to come about in the West 
mm. of the way that we do church. Um, discipleship is so important to me. Um, everything that you're saying, all these frustrations I, I had when I came to the church, and it wasn't because I didn't love the church. I wanted to be around people. <laughs> I love Jesus. Well, who else are we going to talk to? Like, we got to be with the people who love Jesus. Um, but then I noticed all these things that I was like, oh, this needs to be fixed. But no one wants to address the things. That's the craziest thing. It's like, oh, no. No, we can't fix that. That's just how things are, you know? And I said, no, no, no. That's not the God that I serve. And I believe that, you know, we can't fix these things if we want to. And so starting to point those things out, um, people will be like, oh, do you hate the church? Or, you know, you hate tradition or you hate this. And you hate... I'm like, no, I'm just trying to like see where like we're coming up empty and where we're not helping the people that need to be helped. And, you know, Jesus came up with a fantastic, beautiful system and strategy. Um, it is the most like who else would we learn from except for, from Jesus? And he just said, do life with these people, you know, love them. As you were saying, like how to it's so hard carrying the burdens of the people who are going through the addictions or whatever that is, homosexuality or this or that. Uh, someone who's very intellectual and they're doubting a bunch, you know, um, could not even be about sin. <clears throat> but it's like um, the verse that I always think about is there is no um, there is no fear in perfect love. Perfect love casts out all fear, right? And so the main thing that we need to be doing is we need to be loving people. Um, we don't need to be praying for five hours. I mean, if you want to do that, do it. <laughs> but like, um, and we, we, like, there's so many ministries that are not essential, but there's one essential ministry, which is a ministry of love. If we don't have the love, then everything else falls apart without the love. And so that's what we're, what we're really seeing in the, in the Western church today, is that we, we're, we're missing that love in the midst of the church, that patience, that humility, you know, even a dealing, interacting with people like addictions, um, who have addictions or, uh, you know, have sexual struggles. Um, we can both relate to when we start seeing those people, uh, kind of come, uh, like not repent or, you know, get into making mistakes and all that stuff. It actually helps us to reflect back on our relationships with the father and be like, dang, I can't even say anything because I'm the exact way to Jesus, you know, and it humbles you. The process that the Lord has when it comes to discipleship making, it actually strengthens you. Um, so in helping the ones who are really difficult and really hard, um, you actually get spiritually strengthened. And then the, the, the cycle continues because there's like humility involved and there's love involved and there's all these attributes of the Lord, justice, righteousness, you know, all those things. And so um, I, I think like that's something that we need to change and that people like me and you are longing for. And I think more people are going to step up to that, you know. There's going to be more people like the outsiders that are saying, this system is not working. It's not working with the drug addicts. It's not working with the gay people. It's not working with anyone else except the people who, you know, they masquerade with a facade or they got a mask on, you know, and they don't want to talk about anything real and they don't want to get into anything that they're struggling with. Um, they want their private lives. And like, that's the only way that that system works is for those types of people. And so um, I think, and I believe, that the Lord is going to make a change and, and he's going to use people like us if we don't give up on that. Cause we could throw in the towel too and be like, well, I guess God just wasn't it. You know, Jeremiah had this really long ministry of 40 years where he was preaching to a people that would not accept his message. I mean, imagine God telling you right now, like, Hey, you know, Joshua, uh, like you're gonna be doing addiction and recovery for 40 years. And like, you're not going to get any help and no one's ever going to listen to you. And probably maybe like no one's going to come to Christ. Like, would you still do that ministry? Um, I mean, we should. Because look at Jeremiah. He had no resolve to his ministry. You would say he's, he was a failed prophet. Um, but everything that we look back on his life, we get to see the characteristics of God. And it did have some fruit, a lot of fruit that came out of Jeremiah's life. Because I'm, I'm currently studying that book. And so um, that's. I believe that we will see that in our generation. I'm believing for that. If it doesn't happen, that's on God. You know, it's whatever God wanted. But I do believe there needs to be a change. And, and places in the West, discipleship, underground churches, persecuted nations of Christianity, they're doing that. They're living life with people. They're discipling people. They're loving on people that are really difficult to love. They're not religious in any type of way. They sit down. They, uh, they read the Bible. They don't even call it the Bible. They can't even say the Bible over there in those countries. They'll get killed. Um, and they show people the love of God and they work with them. And everybody's a leader in that aspect of that's what the Bible says, you know, go out into all the nations and make disciples. Then say, go out, make church buildings and stay there. 
to go out to every person um, and everybody needs to be doing that. And so there will be that rise up of that, those outsiders um, where, we're, where me and you are both coming from. But we can't give up. Yeah, yeah, no. And it's, I mean, we're definitely seeing a transition as far as like we're seeing a lot more house churches. That's like one of the more popular moves right now is a lot of smaller house churches. And and I actually, I actually prophesied, um, this was like 2021, I gave a word, not like super like from a big platform or anything, right? But uh, <laughs> um, but I gave a word that I'm seeing play out, you know, um, where I said that there's going to be three breaks in the church. We're going to see the first group of people, they are stuck to their traditions and what their dad and their dad's dad and dad, grandpa's grandpa has taught. And it's a very strict religious, traditional Christianity with church and like this and everything set up how it's been. And they are going to hold on to that frame and they're going to slowly get left behind because God's doing his next move where people are going to be loose and with the spirit and they're going to be able to change and be able to move into the next mold. And then we're three. And then the third is we're going to see people fall away. You know, a lot of people falling away from it. And so I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of people stuck to their tradition and they're getting mad over the new wave. And, um, and so. Uh, man, man. there's going to be really crazy stuff I think that's going to happen, um, especially as we go near and nearer to the end times. Um, who knows if it's going to be in our, in our generation or in the next generation or, you know, whatever happens. But uh, I never talk about this on the podcast. This is interesting. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I do have hope. And, um, and it's glad to know I'm not the only one out there, you know, especially when it comes to, like, men. Um, like, right now, the women are taking over, which is a beautiful thing. Um, they're finally starting to understand that they can minister just as much as men can minister. Um, but also now the men are being targeted, feminized by culture. There's a lot of different things that are happening that are actually reducing the authority and the power that men have. Um, and men have their place too. We both have place, men and women, you know, together side by side. It's like, oh, the women are raising up, so let's just put down the men. No, 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 like raise up the women, raise up the men, let's do it together. Uh, but real men that have a heart of the Lord and have a heart of the Father. And, and I believe that's like where you're coming from too. Uh, because in order to work with people that sh- struggling with addictions, you got to have the heart of the Father because you're going in every single day and you got to find that mercy and that forgiveness and that love. And, and we're spiritually making like children from, from the Lord, you know, adding yeah. them into the family of God. Um, and so just see that heart of the Father from you and from, I'm sure, so many other people that I, I keep encountering. The Lord just keeps bringing more awesome people. Uh, it, it, I, I have a lot of hope in that. But um, so you were talking earlier about like how not to kind of get burnt out from ministry that you've been feeling a little burnt out. And, um, and I want to talk about that because that's literally the season that I'm in right now as well about how you've been doing the, uh, like online ministry and you just want to see some bad go. Like you said, you want to keep yourself in intimacy. Uh, why is intimacy so important? It's everything. Uh, <clears throat> there's that. That's literally what I mean. And the thing is, is, I'm 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 grateful to God because I was raised with that. Like I said, two months where all I was in was a cocoon. Everything flows from intimacy. A ministry that's not birthed out of intimacy is birthed out of religion and human effort. If because there's a lot of talented people, like you can you can have a successful ministry and build it as large as you want with with just charisma and you know what I mean? Like you can do all the church stuff. You could have a good choir. Like you can do it if that's what you want. Um, but intimacy is where the power comes from. The supernatural power comes from for our life. And without intimacy, the intimacy is like, I look at it like this. Imagine, um, I'm a visual person. So God speaks to me a lot with like visuals in my head. Right. So imagine your life, you're dead in sin before Christ. Right. It's you, if you look at a heart machine, it's just a flat line. Mm-hmm. Jesus is life. That's what it says in, in yeah. John, um, John 17. He is eternal life, or First John 1. So um, now you got the heart machine with the, right? Like <laughs> where we come together, his life should be pressing into us. And so our dead life should then be moving just like his, right? And so it's like intimacy is what keeps us like together with God. It says in Colossians that the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Christ because he humbled himself unto the point of death. That was, I mean, that's not in the same scripture, but that's another scripture. He humbled himself to the point of death. Colossians is the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. 
That's why, because he was humble to the point of death. And so when we're, when we're intimate with God, we have to have humility to stay intimate with God because he's going to cause us to do things that pride will say no to. And yeah. so it's like when we stay in that place of where we're constantly connected to him, God is pleased to dwell and fill us with more of himself. So it's like that intimacy, um, I always say I don't, that's, and that's part of why I'm taking a little, little break for a minute is because I've noticed, okay, now like I'll make, say a video or, or talk to someone um, and it won't come from overflow. Mm-hmm. It will come from like, oh, I just, I want to talk about this, right? And that's when I know, all right, I need to go back to the secret place for a while and shut it all down because not that I'm off, not that I'm wrong, not that I, uh, it's not loving or I don't mean what I say or it's not God's word or something. It's that anytime it comes from me coming from myself and not like it just oozes out of me, I don't want it. Like, cause that's not overflow. And so I'm, I might be a little more harsh on myself with this because I've seen the difference. And that's why, cause I've seen the difference. When I'm in a place, let's say, I, I, let's say, uh, I spend, you know, a week fasting and praying, you know, I spend that whole week with God, just locked away. I'm not doing anything just with Jesus. Um, that next day that I come out of that, stuff that is way out of my control will start happening. And what I mean by that is I won't be trying. I will walk into grocery stores and situations will just present themselves to me. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah, it just... God is doing everything, and because I'm with him, I, I know how to navigate it. Um, and so anyways, that's, it's, it's like everything flows from there, because if you're not in intimacy and you're flowing from just your gift or you're flowing from religion, or you're flow- that's how you get burnt out. That's, I mean, that's when you're in intimacy, you're in grace, and so everything is supernatural. And so, yeah, I, I like to stay in that place, and, and I've been definitely having just things going on that's kept me from being there as much as I like, you know. That's so beautiful, man. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with that. And it's not even just like um, it, you could even just be receiving something from God and then immediately giving it away, you know, oh, man. And, and that's yeah. like that there goes, you know, the life. And then and then you immediately have to go back to God to get that refilled. Like to me, I'm, I'm kind of like a little bit of a workaholic. I enjoy ministry. I love helping people. I love being there for people. Like when people send me messages and they're like, um, oh, Sammy, I need help on this or I need that. Like, I'm not like, uh, like I got to help this person. No, I, I like, I enjoy it. And so since I enjoy that so much, it's so hard for, for me to pull myself away to get alone with God. But I understand exactly what you're talking about because I had my cocoon season. My cocoon season wasn't like two, uh, two months of jail. My, my cocoon season was like three years with the Lord. Um, before anybody knew my name, before I had a YouTube, before and nothing, no social media. Like I used to make YouTube videos when I would just feel the prompting from the Holy Spirit, just like, oh, it's been six months. Let me make a video, you know, <laughs> like, because uh, I'd be so lost in the own revelations of what God was doing in my own life. And I was also going to school at that time. And so I remember just those, like, people asked me, what's, like, the best experience that you had, like, in your Christian journey? Um, my best experience has not been in a conference. It's not been in church. Like, it has been alone in the prayer room, like, with my own little worship sets that I listened to from International House of Prayer or Upper Room. And just getting just like, him, like, I got to be in that room and just like experiencing him. There's like another type of feeling. Um, and it's so sad because when you get into ministry, there's such an overwhelming amount of work that needs to be done. So many people need to be loved on um, that you can easily just like, but God, I got to, you know, I got to do this. And then it's like, then you, you sacrifice time spent with the Lord. It's so like, I'm making content. Obviously, people out there that want to watch content every single week. I'm doing meetings on my Discord. Like right now, after I get off this podcast with you, I do a Discord meeting. And, um, and I got to, you know, do, study my Bible. And it's great. You know, like I'm studying my Bible, fellowship with other people. But it's like, oh, I miss the days when like there's no one hitting me up. And I, I could just like get into a worship set and cry and, and process. But then there's also the bad to that too. Because people can get selfish with the presence of God. Um, it's very easy to always go to God. Because uh, that's a beautiful, enjoyable per, uh, place to be. Um, it, like God is so loving, so kind and incredible. You're always going to want to be there. Um, and we can get fat off of just staying there. So this is a beautiful balance of just like you receive, but you also give. And then you receive and you give and you receive and you give. But you never want to give, give, give too much. You're taking away from your time with the Lord. Um, and you never want to just only receive, receive, receive. And he's like, 
I don't want to care about other people's problems because I got my own problems <laughs> and I want to be sitting here with the Lord. Uh, you can actually fix your problems by actually helping somebody else with their problems. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but I feel that, man. Um, I, I had to, like, I, what I, a good healthy thing that I do since I like to work a lot, um, I'll take a couple months when I start feeling that frustration, when I start feeling like I'm, I'm, I'm burning out a little bit, like I've already understood the feelings of it. Um, I start getting like a little bit like sassy, <laughs> a little bit mean. Um, then I'm like, okay, time to get a vacation. So I'll do like a long sabbatical and that way I can really enjoy my time with God and I'll go away, like moving from Miami to California. The last one that I did was like a road trip. Um, and, but I never let myself get to the point where it's like, I'm going to stop ministry because I know that it's needed. I just give myself that rest, that time to rest. And then I continue forward. Um, but rest is so important. Sabbath is so important. It's not just a day in our week. It's, um, it's getting filled up by the Lord. And, and make sure you do anything like with the Lord's presence. Because I feel you too. Like It's like you do something, you make a video or, you know, whatever. Like, and you're like, ah, oh, if I had like God, like an overwhelming amount of like God's presence in that time, it would have come out so incredible or I could have had spoken with passion. I've also learned that it's like, it's not always about the passion. Like sometimes it's just about the due diligence and about getting stuff done when you don't feel like getting it done. Um, and the Lord will um, re- reward you for that because he knows that like, you know, we have responsibilities we got to do. It's not always going to feel incredible when we do those things. And we got to move past that into discipline, past the feelings into discipline. And so I'm discovering that for myself too. Like nobody nobody's taught me that and like I never had no leader like be like you know this is what you gotta do blah, blah, blah. but um I agree man intimacy is everything that's why I'm I'm such a huge like prayer room guy I love any prayer room like is there, if there's people playing music and like you're going in at it for like three hours I'm there like I'm there dude I don't know do you listen to prayer rooms that's are you a music guy and no I was I was I was I didn't want to uh cut you off but you said uh uh, I hop, and I'm I'm a huge Misty Edwards fan. Like that's, I was gonna ask you if you like Misty Edwards. Have you ever met her in person? No, I, no. Oh, I dude, her. I got the chance to meet her in person. Uh, I went yeah. to I hop, and uh, yeah, I was with um, luckily, you know, doing social media and stuff. You get to meet some awesome people, and she's awesome, dude. And yeah. um, and and you know, you can tell people like her have been in the place that mean you have been in. You know, where there was this old video of her like a while back ago. She said, uh, the new generation of Christians during the end times that are going to rise up are going to be the ones that nobody knows in the middle of nowhere. They're not going to have a platform. They're not going to have a stage. Like God is going to just take them from the middle of nowhere and uh, he's going to raise them up and they're going to be so unlike anything around them. They're going to be shining lights. And I remember hearing that like, and I was like a little boy, like in Miami, (laughs) I'm a man, but like, I was like in Miami. And hearing that video, and I was like, nobody knows me. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'm in my like prayer room, and I was like, I feel that. And then look at look at how the Lord has like that prophecy in that video from her. Like, it it changed my life. And she's just so connected because they come from that place. Like her, David Brimer, you know, the sets where they're like using these instruments to worship the Lord. Like it's like, oh, you like you've been there. You've been there in the holy of holies, like with the Lord, where where you see Him clearly. And, um, and I think we all need to get back to that because it's not, it's like, it's both, you know, it's intimacy, discipleship, intimacy, discipleship. You can't have one without the other. You can't disciple people if you don't have intimacy and you, and you don't, you you can't just be intimate and never disciple because what did Jesus say? He said, Peter, do you love me? If you love me, you're going to feed my sheep. And so, um, if we really love him in that intimate place, we're going to feed a sheep when we don't feel like doing it, you know? Um, but I feel you. So <laughs> that's incredible. Um, do you yourself, do you play any type of instruments or music? No, I, I, I used to rap a little bit, but, um, no, nah, I, I want to, that's like one of my, my goals at some point in my life to learn piano or guitar. I'd love to do okay. it, dude. <laughs> the way that I, I, I learned piano, um, I was alone in my room and, uh, I told God, I really want to be a musician. I can never learn before. And I was always a singer, but never a musician. And I just told him, like, teach me how to learn piano. And I would do these, like, night sets at, at this International House of Prayer in Miami. And, um, like, 2 a.m. 
and I would just go in and I could only play with one hand and I could only play one chord. <laughs> I didn't even know it was a chord. And so I used to just go in, just tap on the piano and just sing live to the piano. It was the most innocent, beautiful, like, you could tell I love God because I was not embarrassed. <laughs> but it, it was embarrassing. And, uh, and the Lord, man, when I sat down, I told him, like, this is, I give this to you. If you want this to happen, sure. If you don't, you know, it won't happen. And he helped me. And now I know wow. piano. I know guitar, dude. And wow. I'd, I would, like, that would not be possible without God. So if it's really something you want, he'll, he'll make that possible. Yeah, I've been, I've been praying for him to give me new vocal cords so I can sing good. <laughs> I'll be practicing, but... bro. Anybody, anybody can sing. Um, like it's not about how pretty it sounds. It's about like if the Lord's in it. You know, that's yeah. that's the most important thing. It's like that's when I, I've seen some of the best skillful singers. You don't feel nothing, and then mm-hmm. like somebody who doesn't even you know sounds like a cat screeching, like mm-hmm. making a cry and break down in the Lord's presence, uh, because of the intimacy that they have. Well, well, I definitely had a. Uh, had a bunch of questions to ask you and I didn't ask you, <laughs> uh, but we, the podcast is going for too long now. Um, but I enjoyed your testimony so much, man. And I, I do believe that God is going to use you incredibly over people who are struggling with addictions. And, and I hope that, you know, he really blows up your, your ministry, uh, not in the church, but like just whatever he wants for you to do, whether it's, you know, having that father's heart discipling people, uh, he connects you to the right people, and um, and I believe it's going to be successful. And so I'm sure mo- a lot of people are going to watch this video, and they're going to reach out to you and stuff. And and I'm and I'm glad. And I hope he teaches you in the same way that he he taught me how to have a good balance of like sharing, but not sharing too much, you know. And um uh, and doing with the skills, creativity that he's given you, uh, to minister to other people, but. Is there anything you want to say to people out there who are struggling right now with um, drugs and, and can relate to you? Uh, I guess towards, um, you know, anybody that's struggling with addiction, I like to simplify things. And the most simple thing I would say is at the end of the day, and this goes for anything, life is nothing but choices. And God lays before us a path of righteousness and the world lays one before us that leads to death. And it's like, that's all this is, is just choices. And so when you look at your addiction or whatever it is, it's like you look at whatever you're going to choose. Is it going to take you closer to God or farther away? And when you look at it like that, it becomes a lot easier, I think, to just look at God in those moments and and choose him. And I think when he sees that our heart turns to choose him, he gives us the strength to choose him as well and to follow through with action. And so, um, I would say to anybody that's like in addiction, it's, it's, it, it doesn't, you know, I want to tell you like, it just gets better, but it it doesn't just get better right away. There's like, there's a, and I call it the, the, the season of death where it's like, you got to climb out of this pit, you know, depending on, on how, what you're addicted to and stuff. There's this, this season of where it just sucks. But I know that like I went through, I was going through withdrawals with God in jail with, ten, with eight years over my head, looking at like a three year bid literally the worst time of my life. And I was somehow happier than I ever been in my life going through, you know? And so when you do it with God, he gets you through it and, and you just stick to it. If you're already sober and you're getting, you know, you're in that one week or the two week mark, you just started, keep pressing into it. And it just gets better at that point. But it's all about just making that first choice of, of turning, you know, and turn to God will help you through it. So. Yeah. Cause it's constant, constant, um, like laying on him. It's just, it, it, it's not having a plan, not trying to do it in your own strength. It's just like, Lord, I wholeheartedly just submit to you every single day. Like every day is just coming to him and be like, I can't do it today, God, but you're going to do it with me. You know, he really strengthens those who are weak. Um, if we admit to our weaknesses. Um, and so I agree, man, it's, it's, it's hard with addiction, but it's just coming to him and then not feeling guilty, not feeling, you know, that shame, that condemnation. Uh, knowing that if it's happening, it's for a reason. It's a process of humility and, um, and just being like every day, God, I know you accept me. I know you love me. I want to be strengthened with, by you today. If I make it through, great. If I don't, we'll start again tomorrow. Um, so beautiful words, man. I appreciate you so much, guys. Uh, don't forget to check out Joshua on his Instagrams and 
whatever social media he has, I'll link them down below in the description. Um, so you can go ahead and, and thank him through direct message if you watch this video for coming on to the podcast. And, um, and that's it for this week, guys. We'll catch you on in the next episode. Peace out, everybody. Bye.